According to the FBI, there are between 25 and 50 active serial killers in the US at any given time. Some of them may be doing stuff like this. Welcome to Sick Flicks, where we take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek by examining some of the goriest and most disturbing movies ever made. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're exploring John Eric Dowdle's found footage flick, The Poughkeepsie Tapes. Originally slated for release in 2007, but not actually available on Blu-ray until 2017, The Poughkeepsie Tapes is a found footage mockumentary following the exploits of a vicious serial killer who videotapes all of his murders. Filled with talking head interviews with law enforcement officials, and intercut with grainy and gruesome footage from the found tapes, Dowdle's film isn't as extreme as similar titles like the August Underground movies, but manages to be unsettling thanks to the tone of the story being told. So, just how many bodies will serial killer Ed Carver cut up in this movie? We'll find out later when we score it on the gore card, but for now, let's get to the gore. The film opens at a funeral for a young woman named Cheryl Dempsey. The story of Cheryl Dempsey and what she became is truly one of the strangest, most disturbing things I've ever come across in the history of serial murder. Color me intrigued. And color me even more intrigued as we watch someone stealing her corpse. Now that we're in the film proper, we meet this woman. I had a tenant in this house here who was a very terrible person. <laughs> yeah, he put toilet paper on the roll backwards, drove 45 in the left lane. He was just the worst. Actually, it turns out this is where they found the Poughkeepsie tapes of the title, as this talking head FBI agent will explain. It was my job to watch and log all 2400 hours of the Poughkeepsie tapes. Um, they let this guy watch the tapes? Is he over 17? I'm not convinced this dude could get into an R-rated movie. Sweet, this dude has a full run of Law & Order on VHS. From here to here are the Lenny Briscoe episodes. Our first look at the footage isn't quite what I was expecting. Dude's a lunar, and that's not slang for lunatic, it's slang for someone who has a balloon fetish. Weird. After more talking heads, we finally get down to business. Our unseen killer spots this young girl playing in the yard. Dude, someone really needs to clean the heads and fix the tracking on this VCR. You know, if, if I was the big bad wolf, there's nothing you can do about it. Well, technically, I could lock myself in the house and tell you I'm not letting you in by the hair on my chinny chin chin, sir. I believe that's referred to as the three little pig stratagem. <coughs> Man, dude just knocked out a kid. The Poughkeepsie tapes ain't messing around. I sure hope that kid's okay. But, since we cut to some crime scene photos, guess not. Budget Robert Wrestler here tells us this is the early stages. Dude's still working on his technique. This is nothing. He doesn't even know what he's doing yet. Alright, let's take a detour for a minute. One of the common complaints leveled at this film is that the acting isn't very good. But here's the thing. I fully suspect this is by design. The Dowdle brothers clearly wanted to make a faux documentary that looks like something you'd see on TV circa the year 2000. And if you've ever spent an evening watching Forensic Files reruns, or old episodes of Unsolved Mysteries, then you know they pretty much nailed it. But the thing about those shows, particularly Forensic Files, is that the cops and experts are always terrible in the on-camera interviews. They're cops, not performers. Most people are terrible on camera if they're not actors, or TV personalities, or Z-grade YouTube horror hosts. This isn't criminal minds. The talking head should be kind of bad. For me, this adds to the film rather than detracts. Anyway, next we see our unseen killer getting picked up by some good Samaritans. See kids? It's never a good idea to pick up hitchhikers. Do you mind if I film this? I'm, I'm making a little movie about my trip. It's basically a snuff film. You guys are my stars. Don't worry, you'll get top billing. I'm just gonna credit myself as Alan Smithy. The killer, who tells them his name is Ed, is giving them directions. This must be why they tell you not to drive hammered. It's easy to wreck. And with his left hand holding the camera, he's reaching it out and holding it in front of her face like this. Clearly he went to film school. I mean, he didn't even have a selfie stick. Back in his dungeon, it's wake up time for Jeanette. He's got a surprise for her. I'm guessing it's not a trip to the waffle bar or a continental breakfast. The authorities eventually find Jeanette with her husband's head and her torso. I guess that's better than upper ass, right? The cops do some detecting and hit up all the gas stations along the route. And they manage to find the killer on video surveillance, but old Ed's too smart. He covers his face and gives them a sign language message. Next, Agent Sarah Silverman highlights how good Ed is at hiding the bodies. 
His next victim has basically dumped in multiple locations, and we get to see him doing a little dismemberment work. Clearly this dude graduated from the same serial killer school as the crazy samurai in Flower of Flesh and Blood. From there, we talk to this dismemberment expert. How does one even earn this title? Oh yeah, I majored in dismemberment in undergrad. The coursework was a real killer. Limb Removal 101 was so much work it left me in pieces by the time finals rolled around. Then we talk about Ed's technique. The rookie mistake here is using the wrong saw. Most guys will go craftsman right out of the gate, but I really recommend the DeWalt. Those teeth won't wear down on the neck vertebrae. I mean, there's nothing worse than getting the head halfway off and finding your blade's gone dull. Just adds hours of extra work. Don't look now, but Ed's back on the prowl. His next victim is a woman named Cheryl Dempsey. Yeah, the one from the funeral at the opening. Ed stalks her for a bit, intercepting her phone calls, following her around campus, and breaking into her house. You know, the normal stalker stuff. He's creeping around in the kitchen when he finds the knife block. Realizing that a master craftsman always chooses the right tool for the job, he grabs a knife before heading upstairs. Ed's busy skulking around the room and gets distracted by the panties, and almost gets busted. He's about to reenact the shower scene from Psycho, but surprise, the boyfriend shows up. Undaunted, Ed sets up the camera in a static position, giving us our first look at him. That's a nice Plague Doctor mask. Then he hides in the closet while Cheryl gets dressed. This is one of the scenes that really makes the Poughkeepsie tape so disturbing. By putting us behind the camera with the killer, we're an intimate partner in the crimes he commits. He's our focal point for all of the horrible things that happen in this movie, and it's genuinely unsettling. One of the common complaints about found footage films is that people often wonder why someone in danger would keep filming. It's a valid question, but it's not applicable here. Ed wants this footage, every second of it, and we're along for the ride whether we want to be or not. Cheryl and her boyfriend are going to have some sexy time, but I'm guessing they don't realize they're about to star in a gonzo porn vid, or that a masked killer is peeping from the closet. After a jump cut, Ed emerges in the darkness. He must have had that camera set on EP recording speed, which probably makes no sense to you youngins who grew up with your fancy digital cameras. Ed solid snakes his way back downstairs and finds Cheryl and her boyfriend snoozing on the couch. He gets right up on them, yet again highlighting how vulnerable they are before they wake up. At this point, Ed's done with the cat and mouse. He stalks the boyfriend into the kitchen and attacks him with the knife. Cheryl sees what happens and runs for the door, but Ed has been training for the serial killer games and his time in the 20 yard dash is no joke. We then watch as he subdues Cheryl, but only through the shadows on the wall. It's another creepy touch. Cut to the local news where Cheryl's missing and the boyfriend is found dead. They found Cheryl missing and her boyfriend, Tim Surrey, brutally murdered. I kind of feel like he probably got the better end of the bargain here. Then we come to one of the Poughkeepsie tapes most infamous scenes. Cheryl's still alive and she's been hogtied like she starred in a Japanese rope bondage video down in Ed's Dungeon of Horrors. Hey, how come you didn't empty the dishwasher? Sorry, I was all tied up. What is your name? I am Sam. What is your name? Sam. What is your name? Sam. Man, this dude is like a modern day Ramsey Bolton. While we never really get to see what happened to Cheryl's boyfriend, the cop gives us the gory details. His head had been crushed in, kind of like this, and he had been cut from his anus up to his throat. Back in the dungeon, Cheryl's still trussed up. In many ways, this scene reminds me of some of the real life footage found on the Leonard Lake and Charles Ng tapes. Those two men may have murdered as many as 25 victims in their dungeon located in an isolated cabin in Northern California. Like Ed, they videotaped some of their crimes. Things get even creepier when Ed returns to the scene of the crime. He videotapes himself offering condolences to Cheryl's mother. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Man, what a dick. Back in the dungeon, Cheryl's still bound and now ball gagged. Ed offers to remove the gag, but only if she'll cosplay with him. You're the most by this point, the press is calling Ed the Water Street Butcher. I don't know, that doesn't really have a great ring to it. But hey, he's got a new M.O. He pretends to be a cop and kills this prostitute. Back in the dungeon, Cheryl is still in costume and is clearly suffering from the mental strain of her captivity. You're the master of the place and they deserve it. You're the master of the place and they deserve it. You're the master of the place. Ed's killing some of his victims out on the street, but he does bring a few back to the dungeon. Cheryl's so traumatized she refuses to help them, but as punishment, she's forced to slice this victim's throat. 
after that, we learn Ed has not only changed his M.O. in terms of procuring his victims, he's changed his dismemberment ritual too. Now the bodies are more cut up. All the better to hide the bite marks. Oh, and he's a necrophile. They had been raped post-mortem, and we found matching sperm on four of the bodies. Dude's taken the whole, I've had a long day, I'm gonna crack open a cold one to a whole other level. Budget Robert Ressler here is so desperate to crack the case, he goes to Bundy for help. No, not Al Bundy, Ted Bundy. Bundy offers up some gruesome insights about Ed. You guys will continue to have sex with the body way past the point you ever thought possible. You know what they say about necrophiliacs, they're very busy, they've always got plots to do. Man, I gotta save some of these for when I get to necromantic and aftermath. Don't look now, but the Girl Scouts are here to sell cookies. Come on, movie. We can't kill two more kids, can we? You know, there's a lot of weirdos out there. You know, like guys who have sex with dead bodies. This scene gets more and more unsettling as it goes. Ed basically sizes up these two young girls to decide whether or not he can kidnap and murder them. If you have kids, this is the stuff of nightmares. The girls hear noises from the basement, but Ed just insists it's a raccoon, and then offers to show them. Hey, do you want to see the raccoon I got in the basement? I don't like where this is headed. Luckily, he sends them on their way, but surprise, that table is actually Cheryl. She really ties the room together. Back with the feds, they've got a break in the case. A glass with a fingerprint and DNA from saliva to match the semen Ed's been leaving on his bodies. Has this guy finally slipped up? The print matches another cop, who's immediately placed under arrest. The case looks airtight, but it can't really be that simple, right? Of course not. The cop is found guilty and executed for the murders, but then more bodies start turning up. Guess that legal system isn't so infallible after all. Honestly, of all the complaints leveled at the Poughkeepsie tapes, this one feels the most valid. The framing and subsequent execution of an innocent man really stretches the old willing suspension of disbelief and adds nothing to the story as a whole. We already get that Ed is a mastermind who's smarter than the men and women trying to capture him, and this particular plot thread feels like something out of a Saw film which aren't exactly known for their believability. Anyway, Ed's back out picking up another woman while posing as a cop. Hi. Hi, you having some car trouble? Oh yeah, my car just died. I don't know what's wrong with it. Oh, you need me to call you a tow truck? She's okay with sitting in the back until Ed misses the turn for the gas station. Excuse me? Wasn't that the exit to the gas station? There's a really awful moment where the woman realizes she's not in a car with a cop and there's no way out. This is one of the things the Poughkeepsie tapes does really well. Ed toys with her a bit, because really, he's quite the sadist. Where are you going? You'll see. Some people have found Ben Mesmer's portrayal of Ed campy, but personally I find him terrifying. Sure, the scene with the cape and the mask in the basement is a bit over the top, but everything else here? Pretty terrifying. It's horrifying enough to watch this woman contemplate agreeing to rape to avoid being killed, but that's not nearly as scary as Ed's last line. You know, to be perfectly honest, I don't think either of us are going to want you alive for the things I'm going to do to you. Then, in another infamous scene, we see the victim is restrained in the dungeon while this person crawls into frame. What the hell? Has Ed turned into some sort of BDSM contortionist? I can't really articulate what's so disturbing about this scene, but like the rest of the Poughkeepsie tapes, there's just this feeling of wrongness about it. It's not real, but it's all too easy to imagine these kind of things are happening out in the world around us. And that makes the whole thing incredibly unsettling. Some viewers can't buy into the narrative the Dowdle brothers are creating here, but I do. And I wind up making sure every door in my house is locked anytime I watch this movie. Ed's doing some kind of weird Freddy Krueger cosplay with those finger knives. Guess he didn't have time to finish the last two. He is concerned about his guest's health though, so he offers to check her pulse, which seems a little high. The Poughkeepsie tapes never gets inherently gory like most of the films we cover here on Sick Flicks, and this scene is probably the most overtly graphic one in the film. But as the old saying goes, sometimes less is more. This film might seem tame compared to its found footage compatriots like the first two August Underground films, but I'd argue this is every bit as disturbing as the over-the-top carnage Fred Vogel and the Toe Tag Pictures crew have cooked up in their features. After that, the FBI guy shares all the different profiles about Ed. And man, did they hire Dr. Davis from New York Ripper? These things are terrible. Suspect is a white male aged 18 to 25. White male aged 25 to 35. Black male aged 25 to 30.
In the next segment, the cops think they found Ed again. But what do you think? They raid his house like it's the Bin Laden compound, but the place is empty. Ed's just messing with them again. The house is clean, save for boxes of videotapes and some blood spatter. Clearly, these are the Poughkeepsie tapes of the title. Oh, and there's one more surprise. Ed's left behind a pine box. Is it a dick in a box? No, it's a chick in a box. Cheryl here is in really rough shape. Don't just take my word for it, though. Listen to this doctor. Severe sexual torture, including things like electrocution of genitals and things that are too horrible to say out loud. Wait, there's something worse than genital electrocution? Then, just when you think things can't really get worse, they do. She was torturing herself when nobody was looking. Cheryl's got a lot of therapy in her future. In the next segment, we get to hear from Cheryl herself. She's clearly still broken from the experience, and it's pretty heartbreaking to watch. She's like a deer in the headlights with that thousand-yard stare. Oh, and she's now an amputee. Guess she had to lend Ed a hand when he moved out. And if that's not weird enough, just wait. It's gonna get weirder. And someday he's gonna come back to me, and he's gonna take me away. We already know Cheryl was the girl from the funeral at the start of the movie, but if you guess she was going to kill herself, give yourself a screenwriter's credit. But maybe she was right after all because Ed dug up her grave and stole her body. The feds are sure Ed's still out there, and then we learn that 27 of the original Poughkeepsie tapes were never recovered. What was on those tapes? Or maybe they were worse than anything that we've seen. Oh, they were old episodes of Friends. Say no more. See, Ed's not a total monster. He spared us from those, at least. But wait, there's more. After the credits, we get another scene. Ed's still out there and has another poor woman trapped in his basement. He makes her a deal. She can live as long as she doesn't blink. The scene drags on, blinking feels inevitable, and then it cuts to black. Like most found footage films, the Poughkeepsie tapes is divisive even amongst hardcore horror fans. Part of this is attributable to the fact that the film wasn't released back in 2007. The unexplained seven-year delay of the film, although it did turn up on torrent sites back in 2009, which was when I originally saw it, built up a whole lot of hype. The things people imagined the film to be were ultimately way worse than what it actually is, and thus they were disappointed. Personally, I've always felt the film delivered. It's creepy, it nails that documentary vibe of all the true crime shows that inspired it, and the found footage element is genuinely disturbing. Because of that, the Poughkeepsie Tapes remains one of my all-time favorite horror mockumentaries. But does it deliver the gore? Let's break down the kills on the gore card and find out. Unlike most of our sick flicks movies, the Poughkeepsie Tapes is not overtly bloody. This is a sick flick because it's pretty disturbing, but it does feature some gross anatomy too. We've got a hand sewn into a torso, numerous crime scene photos, a stabbing, a slash throat, and the throat puncture scene. There's not a lot of gore in these kills, and a lot of what makes the film unsettling is implied, but there's just enough here to give the Poughkeepsie tapes three barf bags out of five. It's not so much the visceral gore, but more the tenor of the film that makes this one so disturbing. What's your favorite found footage movie? Let me know in the comment section below. And while you're down there, why not subscribe to the channel? I found a strange box of numerically labeled tapes in my attic the other day, and I need help watching them all and cataloging what's on them. I figured you guys could help. And you wouldn't want to miss out on that, would you? Of course you wouldn't. Oh, and be sure to check out some of my other videos. You'll find links to more sick flicks here on the screen. I'm here to spread the gospel of gore, so why not stick around for another sermon? Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.